When I was in the ministry uh, negotiating in the Eurogroup contest, a very powerful figure within the Eurogroup at the Troika admitted to me in a moment of honesty and confession that our Athens Spring had to be crushed because they didn't want to lose the Iberian Peninsula. Well, we've been to Spain, time to go to Portugal. Rui Tavares is a long standing, was a long standing for many years, member of European Parliament for the Green Party. He has fought fiercely for years to introduce a modicum of rationality in Brussels. Old friend and comrade Rui Tavares, the floor is yours. Aristopoli, dear friends, well, I want to start with some questions, simple questions. Is it acceptable that crucial aspects of the economy regarding millions of people are decided in gatherings of a thing called Eurogroup, which does not have a legal basis on the European treaties and only a very, very brief mention thereof? Is it acceptable that the European Commission, which is the only EU institution that can make law, works on the basis of programs that have not been subjected to a vote and with commissioners that have not been elected? Is it acceptable that then we have a parliament, but this is maybe the only parliament in the world that cannot initiate law on its own? And and, and notice, when the Parliament finally gets to do some legislation, then the Council can kill this legislation with a very simple tool, doing nothing. Because they don't have a deadline to decide on finishing the law. In less developed countries than the European countries, like Brazil, they have five weeks. In India, they have five days. In the, in the European institutions, Council cannot decide forever and kill any law that comes from Parliament. Is it then acceptable that this Council of the EU, that in this Council we are represented by diplomats who make law, but who ever heard of this? Why don't we have elected legislators in the Council of the EU? Or maybe these questions are all too abstract, so let me give you some different examples. Is it acceptable that in our continent, if people are denied access to health care because of cuts that have been ordered by the Troika, that these people cannot go to court to sue the Troika? Well, it is possible in Europe, but it is not acceptable. You know that the only ones that can go directly to the European Court of Justice to sue the Troika are governments. And governments who have borrowed money do not want to go and, 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 uh, or cannot go. And governments who have lent the money do not certainly want to go to court. So we can live in illegality. And the court has said the Troika is illegal. Ask us, because the Troika is illegal and we know it. But there was no one to ask. So, you know, we could go on and on. Is it acceptable? that in the third article of the Treaty of the European Union, the EU institutions have an obligation to implement policies for full employment, and that then they have landed in my country, and Yanis country, and in, in Ireland and other countries, and they have done exactly the opposite, and that this can go unchecked and unpunished? Is it acceptable that if a government, like the Greek government, tries to counter all this, then the full weight of the vengeance of the Eurogroup falls on this government. But if a government, let's say in Hungary, decides to undo democracy, then almost nothing happens. Is this acceptable? I know, I know that tomorrow many people will ask you, have you been to this Yanis Varoufakis thing? European democracy, really? Isn't this all too vague, too fuzzy? And these questions, will be the questions that I will ask you to make to the people we will, we will, who will ask you if European democracy is too vague. It is very concrete. It is about our rights. It is about 
the rights of unemployed youth in the countries that we call peripheral countries. And while we are at it, why do we call these countries peripheral countries? You know, the idea that Greece and Italy and Spain are peripheral countries, it's the idea that in the other side of the sea there is nothing. You know, as if the end of the world was in the Mediterranean. But, well, I'm sorry, historically, the Mediterranean is not the periphery. The Mediterranean is the center of the world, and it is still the center of our world, and it is still the center of the great moral scandal of our times. People want us to forget that there is something on the other side of the Mediterranean, and that's why they keep calling Greece and Italy peri peripheral. So that if in the other side of the sea there is nothing, then it becomes acceptable to say something that for almost three centuries in Europe had become unacceptable since the Enlightenment age, which is to say, if you were born on this side, okay. If you were born in the other side of the sea, tough luck. And, of course, all of this is not acceptable. And if there is something somewhere that is unacceptable, there has to be a moral responsibility that someone, somewhere, does not accept it. And we are that. We are those who do not accept it. We, we do not accept that there is no way out for the European crisis, that we can only either obey or reject, that we cannot transform. We know that historically, in this continent of Ulysses and Penelope, people have imagination to do it again and have perseverance to undo and redo until we find the right formula. So in this continent, we have the three things that we need to change all this because every single of these questions that I've made before, all of them can have an answer that is fair and given in solidarity and justice and fraternity. And we don't even have to change the treaties to give all these answers. We just need these three things. Memory, to know where we come from, because we've all been here before. We have never met before, but we have been here. We have been here against fascism. We have been here for human rights. We have been here for votes for women. We have been here for a green movement. We have been here with other names in other cities of Europe, but we have memory and we know where this continent has come from. <laughs> Second thing, we need imagination. And the imagination requires to make a pledge, which I think it is what we're doing here today. We are pledging to ourselves with our minds and our hearts that we will do the utmost to make the European Union a democracy, not a club of democracies, a democracy for 500 million European citizens. And we are the ones who will start this by practical, by concrete measures and using our imaginations and our powers of persuasion. And lastly, the third thing that we need is courage. Sometimes we need some courage to self-criticize. It is not possible that in progressive Europe we have a split between half of a progressive Europe that is co-opted by the system and helping the establishment do whatever they want to do in Greece and Portugal and anywhere in Europe, and we have another half who says, let's get the hell out of here. So half of our progressive Europe is actively helping the centre-right to govern. And the other half is helping out the far-right. So it, takes, it will also take courage for us to be very clear with everybody, including in our progressive movement. So with this pledge that we will be together and that we will struggle for European democracy, that we will be united in diversity, and that we will find the ways to persuade our fellow citizens across the continent, that we will not forget the people who are not in this continent, but that want to become part of the civil society of the world, we will achieve our goals. 
we will achieve the goals of a sustainable planet with no borders for everybody that inhabits it. We will achieve the goals of a Europe united and free. We will, from Lisbon to Helsinki and from Dublin to Crete to Nicosia, we will achieve the ideal of European democracy and very soon enough it will be a reality. So long live Europe united and free, long live European democracy, liberté, égalité, fraternité, toujours.